Uh, good morning. Just let the thunder and lightning settle for a second. That one? Not quite. Good morning. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's a long introduction. Well, I'll tell you what, thank you. Thanks, Daniel, for working on that, sorting that out. Um, the passage of Scripture before us this morning is in the book of ne- Nehemiah. And so it's Nehemiah chapter 8 and chapter 9 is the passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at. Um, And it's a passage of scripture where we're going to see 10 marks of an incredible spiritual awakening that took place in the the life of Israel. Um, But before we get there, we need to know uh, something of the context. We're just jumping straight to a fresh new book, uh, to a passage within that book. Um, But the events uh, of these two chapters, in Nehemiah 8 and Nehemiah 9... They happen in approximately 445 BC. And so you'll remember that the, the Old Testament comes to a close at approximately 400 BC. Uh, and so we are right at the end of the story of all the events that take place in the Old Testament of the, the Bible. And so it's critical to remember um, as well that the people of Israel living in this time, uh, were, they had been given God's law at Mount Sinai. And in the words of Exodus chapter 24, these people had bound themselves to God's law and they all stood at the, the mountain there as the law was given and they all said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And so the, the people in Nehemiah's day are still living under that arrangement. They're living under the Mosaic Covenant. And it's a conditional covenant of works. Uh, They've been promised, you'll remember in the book of Deuteronomy, clearly sets it out, they've been promised blessings for their obedience and curses for their disobedience uh, to God's law. And you'll also remember that throughout Israel's history, they were stiff-necked and disobedient. And eventually, after all of the, the... I guess the, the, all the events that unfold there in the Old Testament, eventually their disobedience had culminated in their exile in Babylon. They'd been taken off to Babylon. And so this was a severe and devastating judgment that came from the hand of God. The people were taken away to Babylon. But here in our passage, um, they, they, I guess they, in their exile, they were brought really low for their Sin. The southern kingdom had fallen, the temple had been destroyed, and the people had been dragged off as captives, and they were, they're slaves in a foreign land. And so that brings us chronologically uh, to the events described in the, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And in our English books, uh, sorry, in our English Bibles, the, these are uh, books of Ezra and Nehemiah. They're separated as two distinct. Uh, books, but in the Hebrew arrangement, they're considered as just one book. They're just one story together. Um, and, and it's helpful for us to understand that because when we read them together, they cover the period of time where Israel uh, returned to their land from this Babylonian captivity. They come back, and these two books uh, explain together what takes place in that period of time. So that's the context. And Ezra the scribe is the author of both books. And they outline the return of Israel, and they do it in three stages. And so in the, there's three returns. And in the first return, uh, if we were to look at Ezra chapter 1 to 6, we would see the first return, um, and we'd see there the rebuilding of the temple. They lay the foundation for the temple. They rebuild the temple. And the second return is recorded in Ezra chapter 7 to 10. And we see Ezra's focus was on restoring faithful worship according to God's law. And in the third return uh, is actually recorded in the book of Nehemiah, what that we're looking at. And and in that book, we see the rebuilding of Jerusalem's wall. And so the the people 
now have some degree of protection and stability from all the hostility of the people around them. And so as we, as we come to our passage, all that work has been completed and everything uh, has been somewhat restored. They're still living under the, the rule, in a sense, of the Babylonians. They've allowed them to come back, but there's a lot of good things that have taken place that have been restored. And there must have been an immense feeling of relief of, of a second chance or of a new beginning. And so the people are ready to rededicate themselves to the obedience to God's law, to this Mosaic covenant. They've been deeply humbled by their judgment and exile. And just like you and I, when we've been brought low and we've faced the consequences of our own sin, the, the Israelites here, they're finally ready to listen to God. And so perhaps with, with a, a new resolve in their hearts, um, and it might be like any one of us trying to conquer again a, a life-dominating sin, perhaps they roll up their sleeves and they, they say to themselves, this time, this time will be different. This time we will we'll make a better job of this. And so now, the, the first thing we need to notice, I guess, as we, we're almost at the passage, sorry, in Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, so Ezra and Nehemiah, read them together. In the first verse of the book of Ezra, it talks about Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he issues a decree for the people to return and to, for the temple to be rebuilt. And so this event had been prophesied in, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, he tells us the details. It even predicts uh, Cyrus's name 150 years before he exists. He predicts that Cyrus will return the people to Israel. And the book of Jeremiah even gives detail of the 70 years that they will be captive in the land of Babylon. And so when time comes, God would, God's word is fulfilled exactly to the detail. A man named Cyrus is born and he releases the people. And so our first observation of everything that we're going to see take place is that everything happened by the providence of God. That's the first mark of everything, that God was ultimately in control of every event that was taking place. And so uh, if you look now at uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1, and, and keep your finger there, we'll, we'll work through this chapter in some detail. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. In verse 1 it reads, And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. And so not just some of the people, all of the people, it says, are flocking to Jerusalem. So we could think of this as this, we have really high church attendance. Everyone is, is coming. All the people are gathering. And in the if we read the previous chapter, I think it's in chapter 8, there's approximately 40,000 people that would have gathered, uh, and they would have been buzzing with anticipation. They're all gathered at the square. And so this was a, a large public space, um, somewhere that could accommodate everybody. And rather than the, the preacher trying to get the people's attention and trying to get you to listen to me, um, in this situation, um, the people here... This, this was an incredible time, and the people here are calling for the preacher. They're calling for the word of God. And they, they call for Ezra the scribe, and they use these famous words. They say, bring the book. <coughs> and so to give you some idea of who Ezra is, um, in Ezra chapter 7, verse 11, don't look for it, I'll, I'll just read it out. In Ezra seven eleven, he's described as Ezra the priest, the scribe. And it says, a man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. And ultimately, uh, Ezra's influence and blessing will be credited to the fact that in Ezra 7 verse 9, it says this, the good hand of God was upon him. But in Ezra uh, 7 verse 10, the following verse, and thinking from the standpoint of human responsibility, we see the, the secret to his ministry and the effectiveness of of this man's ministry, and it says this, for Ezra had set his heart, he had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. And so to, to set his heart means he, he set it firmly. Uh, it was a, he was 
inwardly driven and he was motivated to do this. He wasn't flippantly thinking he might do this. He was fixed in his determination uh, to do these three things. And so he had uh, fixed as a priority of his life, the first thing was the diligent and careful and intensive study of God's law. So he had an insatiable hunger to understand the meaning of God's word. And he, pers- he persisted in this with an undiminished zeal. And he did this for 14 years. Uh, so he didn't, he didn't just do this for a couple of weeks and, and think he'd be ready to go. He, he set his heart for a long period of time uh, before he was uh, called to, to teach at this great occasion. The second thing in this verse, it says, uh, he knew that the, this knowledge alone, knowing God's word, was, was not enough. He also set his heart to be obedient to God's law. And so he wanted to put his theology into practice. And the third thing he did was he desired to teach this to God's people. And so we might say uh, he was a churchman. Uh, he wanted to serve others and be a blessing to God's people. And so he wasn't motivated by doing any of this for himself. Uh, And so that's a brief biography of the man that the Israelites here call upon. They want that man uh, to come and read God's law. And those are also marks of any man that God would, I'm sure, call to to teach his word. And so they called Ezra to bring the book uh, because he was the most qualified man in the country. He was the, the best person they could call upon to explain God's word to them. And so one commentator says, Ezra now emerges from obscurity and it is typical of him that he has quietly waited to be asked for. And so I, I think we can see here our, our second mark of this spiritual awakening is that the preacher was uh, prepared. But if you look at verse 2, it says, there, Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. And so we, we see that this gathering, it included everyone, even children, uh, at least those that were of an age that were able to understand. And so we see that God's word here is not just for the clergy or just to be held for the leaders. Uh, we, we see that it's, it's to be made known and it's to be made use of by all of God's people. God's word needs to be taught and understood by all of God's people. At the end of verse uh, two, it says this happened on the first day of the seventh. Oh, sorry, of the seventh month. And this day, I was surprised to to know that it became known as New Year's Day or Rosh Hashanah, a day of new beginnings, uh, which is really fitting because this was the dawning of a new day in the life of these people. If you look at verse three now, it says. He read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. And so not from 9.30, but from about 6 a.m. until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand. And when it says he read from it, he's reading from God's word. He's giving an exposition of God's word, and he's either, either teaching the whole book of Deuteronomy, I believe, or he's taking selected parts from the, the whole Pentateuch, the first five books or or the Torah, the law of God. Um, And so we can see here that this time of awakening, it was anchored in Scripture. Um, So that's our next mark of what's going on. It was anchored in Scripture. And what I found fascinating was this word read. It says he read it to the people. Uh, It doesn't mean what we might think it means. And so the Hebrew word means to cry out, to proclaim, to utter a loud sound. And so Ezra is not just reading. He's passionately preaching. He's moved by what he's doing. And if you remember, the scene here is that there's no microphones. He has to lift his voice up. And there's approximately 40,000 people gathered. And so there's no way that he's just reading in a monotone voice and boringly just reading the Lord of God's people. He, He is a man that's lifting up his voice and passionately teaching the Word of God. And so it makes me think of what Martin Luther Um, during the the 16th century Reformation, another time of revival. And the people spoke of the amazing vigor of Luther's language. And 
And J.I. Packer, he captured this by writing, he said, The gospel of God is in jeopardy. The springs of Luther's religion is touched. The man is moved. The volcano erupts. And arguments pour out of him white hot. And so I think that, I imagine Ezra as a, as a man similar to that, who is, who is determined to study God's word, determined to teach it. He knows how important it is. And he's now uh, teaching that to God's people. <coughs> Excuse me, and so I'm a little disappointed when we read, it just says he read it, he read the word. I think we lose something there of, of the, the scene that's going on. But we can, we can say that another mark of awakening is that the preaching was electric. And, and it must have been, because like I said, this was a six-hour teaching session. And it must have been able to engage and keep people's attention for a long period of time. And so I feel quite inadequate here to do that. I think I'd be struggling to do that with you. But verse 3, it ends by describing the people. And so it's not just the preacher, the people. We see how, how they, what, what their state was. And it says, all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And I want you to notice this because the results of this occasion are tied up with the attitude, not just of, the, of Ezra delivering God's word, but they're also tied up with the attitude of the people all the people were attentive. They were intensely interested. They were on the edge of their seats, and no one is looking at their phone or falling asleep. And I'm scanning around to see if I can catch anyone. But they're listening. They're all engaged. And so another mark of, of this is that the, 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 they're not just listening to a sermon. They, they want to be there. They're, they're participating in all that's going on. Um, and so another mark of of what's happening here is that the people were engaged. Uh, in verse 4, Ezra the scribe, it says, Ezra the scribe stood on a, at a wooden podium which they had made for the purpose. And so you can think of this as a, a prototype pulpit, um, but it shows us that it was a prepared event. It was not a, a mere spontaneous occasion that had just been whipped up and came out of nowhere. A wooden pulpit and a large platform or a stage had been specifically made beforehand. So thought had gone into everything that was happening. There, and there would have been, I'm sure, as, as there are, are always, there would have been those unnoticed workers among God's people that were setting everything up. And if we read the context, there were musicians and singers and priests and Levites and people, people preparing for food. Uh, all those things were part of this occasion. But verse 4, it continues. It says, And, and beside him stood... Uh, six men on his right hand and, and seven men on his left hand. And if you can imagine, standing before all the people, you have Ezra the scribe in the middle. Uh, there's, a, there's a pulpit in the center on a platform. And, and here, with these, these men at either side, the picture here, it's a demonstration of unity. And so all the leaders are standing right there with Ezra, and they all share the same convictions. And so Ezra isn't some crazed heretic that's found some new and wonderful and strange teaching. He's standing and teaching in solidarity with all the leaders of Israel. This is the true Christian faith that's attested to by, by other respectable men. Uh, and so they're standing with Ezra. And if you look at verse 5, it says, Ezra opened the book. And in reality, this is a, a scroll. This is there's not a book how... how we have, but he, he opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And so I was tempted to ask someone to arrange that to happen today, but I trust you can imagine. And some churches do that, don't they? They will stand for the reading of God's word. And it shows the reverence the people had for God, the submission and the respect that they had and took for God's word. They all knew that when the Bible was opened, it was really God and not Ezra that was speaking to the people. And so verse 6, it says, Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And so the, the, before he says anything else, he, he blesses the Lord, the great God. And so we see here that Ezra had a high and towering view of God, and he was God-focused in his orientation. He wasn't man-focused. He was focused on God and exalting God. 
And we see the immediate results of this because it says, And all the people answered, and all the people said, Amen, Amen, which means it is firm, it is established, God is great. Um, and while lifting up their hands, they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And so that's, isn't that quite humbling to even think of? We're sitting in our seats thinking, yeah, I, I love the picture there, but we're kind of sitting in our seats. But the, the important thing we need to take here is not, not a literal, literal instruction. We don't need to come and bow down. I think in, in some churches, they even have like a kneeling uh, bit of timber at the bottom of the pew in front of you so they can tell you when to bow down, when to sit up, when to stand. But the important thing is that this is a, an inward posture and reality to us, that our hearts are bowed low and worshipful. <coughs> and so this is another key mark of this awakening that's getting momentum and something's happening here. Another mark is that Ezra's teaching exalted the greatness of God. And if you look now at verse 7, we see some of the Levites that are, that are scattered amongst the crowd of people. So there were people on the stage, there's Ezra teaching, and there were Levites that were scattered in, in amongst all these thousands of people. Um, and, and we're asking, well, what do they do? And, and so in verse 7, I think towards the end there, it says, they explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the book of the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. And so this is such a simple yet powerful concept. They explained the meaning of the scripture, and that is another key mark of any revival or spiritual awakening. They explained to the people what the scriptures meant. Uh, Martin Luther, again, uh, it's hard not to see parallels with, with that moment in history, uh, but he had in his possession some of the writings of a man called John Huss, uh, and this man lived a hundred years before he did. Uh, and, and Luther marveled at this incredible preacher as he read through some of his work, read through some of his sermons, and, and John Huss had lost his life for denying the Pope to be the head of the church. And, and Luther said this, he said, I could not understand for what cause they had burnt so great a man. <coughs> and it says, it says of him, who explained the scriptures with so much gravity and skill. That's what, that's what John Huss did. And so to... Um, and, 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 and that's what Luther did himself as well. And, and at, the, at his Reformation, he says, from the beginning of my Reformation, and not that it was his, but the Lord's, you know what he's saying, from the beginning of my Reformation, I've asked God to send me neither dreams, nor visions, nor angels, but to give me the right understanding of God's word. That's what... That's what happened when the word of it, God is explained. And so to put the nail in the coffin, if I give you another third example, we see in Jesus' own ministry uh, in Luke 24, 27. I'll just read this to you. When Jesus appeared, you remember the two men walking on the road to Emmaus and Jesus appears next to them and they don't recognize who they're talking to at first. And it says of Jesus, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. And so Jesus explained the scriptures to them. And in verse 32 there, we see the results. These men say when Jesus is left and their eyes are opened and they, they see who he was, they say, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened to us the scriptures? <coughs> and so this is the, the result of explaining God's word to God's people. And I'm sure most of us can look back to a stage of our life where we perhaps discovered the simplicity of expository teaching and the effect it had on our lives. But in, in verse 9, this is, um, this is the result we see. So in verse 9 it says, Then Nehemiah, uh, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God, do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. <clears throat> and you must remember here that um, it was specifically, it was the law of God. 
Uh, you can imagine the Ten Commandments being written, read out and explained, the law of God that was being taught. And, and you can imagine that these returned refugees from Babylon, I think it was about 900 miles and a four-month journey that they'd traveled uh, to get back here. Uh, they'd lived their whole lives surrounded by the Aramaic language. And so in these books, we see some of that coming through, not just the Hebrew, but they'd been surrounded in Babylon by the Aramaic language. They're hearing now their own law. They'd lived their whole lives, most of them, totally in a different culture. Now they're hearing their own law translated and explained to them from their own Hebrew scriptures. They must be so disorientated, realizing how lost they really were, how humiliating it would have been to hear uh, of these blessings and curses that were fundamental to their well-being and the retention of their land. And they were warned not to worship other gods. And they would have thought, oh, we worshipped other gods. And they were commanded to separate themselves from the sexual immorality and the pagan philosophies of the surrounding nations. And they would have thought, oh, we got carried away and all those things. And, and so this uh, severe judgment was, was, they were told, if you persist, severe judgment will come. And it had come. And, and they would have been, while in Babylon, they would have been separated from the regular teaching and hearing of God's law. There would have been a, a famine in the land uh, for the hearing of God's law. <coughs> and so here they, are, here they are now. Perhaps they're realizing for the first time the true extent of their rebellion and their desperate situation. And perhaps it's finally starting to sink in for these Israelites that have tried and failed, tried and failed, and perhaps they're finally seeing that uh, their situation was a direct result of their own opposition to God, their own rebellion. And so we can observe another mark of this awakening and say God's law had wounded their hearts. And they were, they were brought under great conviction of sin. And we can think of this one sense, we can think, what a... What a sad day this is. People have been exposed. Their hearts have been opened up. They, they're remembering all the terrible things that they've done. And so they're mourning. They're weeping as they hear God's word. Um, but look here, it says, Ezra, he's actually exhorting them not to be sad. They're, they're all in tears. And he's saying, don't be sad. And so he said, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. And perhaps you're thinking, well, maybe they should weep. This repentance is good. They needed to come to repentance. But by God's providence, I can't explain this in any other way, the day that they were on at this particular time was actually the Feast of Booths. And so in Deuteronomy 16 and verse 14 and 15, this is how it explains how they are to observe the Feast of Booths. It says, you shall rejoice in your feast because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and all the work of your hands so that you will be altogether joyful. <laughs> and so this is a, I think this is a beautiful picture of God's grace where the, the heavy-hearted sinner's grief and repentance is quickly comforted. It's quickly uh, turned into joy. They're not left in that state for a long time. And so as soon as there is repentance, there is reason for rejoicing. And we should never forget that, whether we're coming to faith or we're living the Christian life, that there's, as soon as there is repentance, there is reason for rejoicing. And so hearts were first wounded, but hearts were now healed. And in verse 10, if you look down at verse 10, it says, Then he said to them, Go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so it's this, for us, it's this salvific joy that's the anchor of the soul of every believer. It's this great weight of gratitude and joy that we feel towards God. It's like a ballast, that big weight in the bottom of a ship, and it keeps us steady through all the trials of life. But the instruction here is to go and celebrate and enjoy a fellowship meal together. Verse 11, so the Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. <coughs> Excuse me. All the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions and to celebrate a great festival. 
And we might say, well, why did this all happen? And the verse continues, because they understood the words which had been made known to them. The explaining of the scripture was causing everything that was going on. And so one commentator said it right, I think, when he said this, God's word preached in the power of the Holy Spirit and with authority will command attention. The reading of God's word brings revival. (laughs) Excuse me, if you turn... Uh, Now to uh, chapter 9, we'll skip a few verses to 9 verse 5. And I want to give you one final mark of this uh, spiritual awakening. And my final observation is that the people are changed. And so in chapter 9 we see a prayer that the Levites, they cry out to God on behalf of all the people and they confess the sin of all the people and they think back on their whole history of, of all their dealings with God and all the times they've rebelled and all the things that they've done. And so that's what we read here in, in chapter 9. And it says they, they begin by blessing God, which is nice because I think they've learned that from Ezra. But they arise. It says, Arise, bless the Lord your God forever and ever. O oh, may your glorious name be blessed and exalted above all blessing and praise. Verse 6, You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that's in it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them and the heavenly host bow down before you. And then they recall all the the gracious blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. Verse 7, this is chapter 9 and verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of the Ur of Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanite, of the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite, and to give it to his descendants. And you have fulfilled your promise, for you are righteous. And then they recall the great works that that God did for them in the Exodus. So think back to the Exodus, verse 9. You saw the affliction of... Of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. Then you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants and all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted arrogantly toward them. You made a name for yourself as it is this day. You divided the sea before them, so they passed through in the midst of the sea on dry ground. And we're meant to think that is incredible what God has done. And their pursuers, you hurled into the depths like a stone into raging waters, and with a a pillar of cloud you led them by the day, and with a pillar of fire by night to light for them the way in which they were to go. So God had even led them and shown them where to go. And then they recall the, the giving of the law as they came out from the Exodus, verse 13. Then you came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments, So you made known to them your holy Sabbath and laid down for them your commandments, statutes, and law through your servant Moses. You provided bread from heaven for them in their hunger, just miraculous provision of physical needs. You brought forth water from a rock for them in their thirst, and you told them to enter in order to possess the land which you swore to give them. And and they, they begin now to confess their sin in verse, verse 16. But they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. And in spite of all that God had done, they acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. They refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But You are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. And so now they they recall one of the, perhaps one of their worst sins, one of their worst blasphemies that they had committed against God. Verse 18, even when they made for themselves a calf of molten metal and said, this is your God who brought you up from Egypt and committed great blasphemies. Uh, Verse 19, you, and how does God react to them? You, in your great compassion, 
did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not leave them by day to guide them on their way, nor the fire, pillar of fire by night to light them the way in which they were to go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. Your mana did not, you did not withhold from their mouth. You gave them water for their thirst. Indeed, 40 years you provided for them in the wilderness, and they were not in want. They didn't lack anything. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. You also gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them as a boundary. They took possession of the land of Shion, the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, the king of Bashan. Uh, verse 23, you made their sons numerous as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So their sons entered and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land of the Canaanites. Yeah, and just think of these incredible battles and victories and the ways that they were winning them. You gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land. Remember the walls of Jericho just falling down when they marched around it. Uh, but uh, you, you, with their kings and the peoples of the land to do with them as they desired. They captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took possession of houses full of every good thing, hewn cisterns, vineyards, olive groves, fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and reveled in your great goodness. And so the, uh, this is just incredible how they've acted and how God's treated them. And they have recalled how good God had been to them. And verse 26 says, But they, <laughs> after all of that, but they became disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets, <laughs> excuse me, and killed your prophets who, who you had admonished them so that they might return to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you delivered them into the hand of their oppressors who oppressed them. But when they cried to you in the time of their distress, you heard from heaven according to your great compassion. You gave them deliverers and delivered them from the hand of their oppressors. Um, but as soon as they had rest, as soon as they're not going through any trouble, they did evil again before you. Therefore, you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. Uh, when they cried again to you, you heard from heaven and many times you rescued them according to your compassion and admonished them in order to turn back to your law. They acted arrogantly and did not listen to your commandments, but sinned against your ordinance by which if a man observed them, he shall live. That's the promise of life for keeping the law. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not listen. And I read during the week that that stiff-necked kind of word that we hear is like an animal like a, that will refuse to, be, to receive the yoke upon it. They were a stiff-necked people. Uh, verse 30, however, you bore, them, uh, you bore with them for many years and admonished them by your spirit through your prophets Yet they would not give ear. They wouldn't turn their ear to God. They wouldn't listen to God. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great compassion, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and compassionate God. And I think we've seen an extremely gracious, patient, and compassionate God. And, and so now they, they start to turn to their own situation in verse 32. It says, Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who keeps covenant and loving kindness. And so even though they would break the Mosaic covenant, the law of God, there was also the Abrahamic gracious covenant of blessing that undergirded it. So every time they would break God's law, God is able to be gracious and forgive them. Um, but verse 32, Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who keeps covenant and loving kindness, do not let all the hardship seem insignificant to you, um, which has come upon us, our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and on all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria to this day. So that's the recent sins that they've all committed. Uh, and in verse 33, it sums up everything. However, this is what the people say. This is model words for uh, a confession of sin. They say, however, speaking to God, you are just in all that has come upon us. For you have dealt 
faithfully and we have acted wickedly. So their, their thinking has totally turned around. Uh, verse 34 says, <coughs> excuse me, for our kings, our leaders, our priests, our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your admonitions, which you have admonished them, but they in their own kingdom, with your great goodness with which you gave them, with the broad and rich land with which you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil deeds. Behold, we are slaves today, and as to the land which you gave to our fathers to eat of its fruit and its bounty, behold, we are slaves in it. Its abundant produce is for the kings who you have set over us because of our sins. They also rule over our bodies and over our cattle as they please. And so to finish it off, we are in great distress. And so that's the, it's the people's confession of sin. Looking back on all that they've done, come to a clear change in their mind. And so that's the confession of a people that have been deeply changed by God's word. It's had a huge effect on them. And so the, the last thing they do here is in verse 38, and it says they, they make a, a covenant or an agreement. And so they recommit themselves to keeping the Mosaic Covenant. They want, they want to recommit themselves to God again. And so look at verse 38. It says, Now because of all this, of everything that they've just uh, admitted and, and asked for forgiveness and all the sins that they've done, because of this, we are making an agreement in writing. And on the sealed documents are the names of our leaders, the Levites and the priests. And so this is a, a formal commitment that they have made uh, to returning to obedience to keeping God's law. And so you can imagine this, this 40 odd thousand people that have returned from Babylon that they resolve and set their hearts again after all of their long history. They resolve this time we will keep God's law. And so as we look back, we've seen that this awakening was, was caused by the providence of God and the power of God's Spirit. The preacher was prepared. The teaching was anchored in Scripture. The preaching was electric. The people were engaged. The teaching exalted the greatness of God. They explained the meaning of the Scriptures. God's law had wounded their hearts. Their hearts were then healed and inflamed with joy. And the people were changed. That's all that we've seen take place, uh, 10 marks of this spiritual awakening. And perhaps that's uh, what I should have called my sermon, 10 marks of a, a spiritual awakening. But I chose a different title, and I'm not sure if it's been up behind me or not, but I, I called it, This Time Will Be Different. And I did that because I don't know if you've ever felt yourself to be on, on the treadmill of recommitting your life to God. I think I did that several times as a young person until I truly understood the gospel. Uh, just re again, God, I think, I think at the next camp I did it again, and the next one. But we recommit, we have this habit of thinking like that. And I, I know some of us have been doing that old, uh, our whole lives potentially. We, we drift away from God, we drift into sin, and after some time we, we might come back to our senses and we, we say, oh, I'll, try to, I'll try again, and, and this time is going to be different. And then we do it all over again and again, and we never seem to find rest. It's just a perpetual cycle of trying harder. And so I want you to, for, to know today, for all the good that we've seen in that passage, and everything I've said to you, I want to stick in your mind. Those are 10 beautiful marks of, an, of a genuine work of God that happened in that time. But as the, the curtain closes on here uh, at the end of the Old Testament, there's, there's a period of 400 years where there's no more prophecy, where the Israelites live through. So the curtain goes down, 400 years pass by. And then we see uh, on the scene John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and the New Testament. It's like the sun's dawning. Uh, and the, the revival that we've just witnessed here at the end of the Old Testament, you might have thought they got it. They finally got it. But they didn't get it. it. They recommitted themselves again. I'm going to keep all of God's law. And they didn't. They declined again. And so the, the spiritual condition when Jesus came was not healthy. It was not as we've seen at this high point. Um, but in the, 
There's devastating words in Psalm 78 verse 32. And it speaks of Israel and all of that long history. And it says, for all this, like for all of God's goodness, for all their repeating uh, failures and all the goodness and faithfulness that God had shown to them, for all this, it says, they sinned still. And you're just, you're kind of gutted. You're not satisfied, are you, like hearing that? And, and I think this was the silent scream and the frustration that echoes throughout the entire Old Testament. They're trying to keep God's law. And no matter how hard we try, you could just imagine them. If, if Israel was a single man that had lived through all those events, he, he would be sitting there saying, I've tried, but no matter what I do, I just can't keep it. And so I mentioned at the beginning, it's important to know that they were under the Mosaic covenant. It was a conditional covenant. It was a covenant of works. It depended on the people keeping God's law. And though it held out the promise of eternal life, I mentioned that in uh, 9 verse 29, this is always impossible for people that are sinners like you and me. Like we can try to keep God's law, but we'd never get, the law demands perfect, perpetual obedience. And there's no way we can ever ever do it. And so if you've gone through uh, your life, um, some people I'm sure haven't, but I know from this was partly my experience for a number of years, just recommitting yourself, you feel like you're on that treadmill. The chances are that you may be viewing your relationship with God through the lens of a covenant of works, because in the New Testament, we are under a covenant of grace. Uh, Galatians 3.24, it says the law uh, is described as a tutor. It wasn't the end. Uh, it pointed towards something, and it said the law was a tutor to lead us to Christ. And in Hebrews 8.13, it speaks, it describes the old covenant, which is particularly the Mosaic covenant, and it says that it has become obsolete. It's growing old. It's vanishing away. Uh, and so instead of trying to recommit ourselves to keeping God's law, we, we do want to try to honor God with the way we live, but our relationship to God isn't based on our keeping of God's law. We need to recommit ourselves to resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ because in the new covenant, Jesus has kept God's law. He actually did it. All of Israel tried and failed. Adam in the Garden of Eden, he tried and he failed. And if we were to try and have the mindset of keeping God's law as the basis or the grounds for our acceptance with God, we would try and we would fail. And so we, we tweak a little thing in our minds that we rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so that, I hope, helps us get off that endless cycle of recommitting to trying harder and doing better because the work has been done. And so when we, when we trust in Christ by faith, he, he treats us, he imputes to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He was the only one that kept God's law. And so um, when we trust in him, his perfect life, life, as I said, it counts for us. And I love that verse, the joy of the Lord, that becomes our strength. That becomes the base by which we live out of and, and live a life obedient to God. And the beautiful thing about the new covenant is we don't have a, a pillar of cloud or fire that we're following through the city of Hastings. We, we have the Spirit of God put in us internally, and he takes out our old heart, which is a heart of stone, and it's like we've been trying to whip that stone all day long, trying to motivate it, and it's a stone. And God takes out our heart of stone. He puts in us a heart of flesh that's sensitive and able and willing and motivated to keep God's law. He changes us, puts his spirit in us, and he causes us to walk in his ways. That's the new covenant. <coughs> and so let's bow our heads and, and pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we, we thank you for um, this wonderful uh, passage of scripture we see uh, modeled so many incredible uh, things, so many examples that we can learn from and model our ministry from. Uh, Lord, we, we see truths that mean so much to us as a church and the things that we 
particularly hold dear and focus on. And Lord, we, we thank you that we see as well that this, this law points us to Christ and it helps us to see our inability and it helps us to see his ability. And we thank you for living at this time in history where that is so clear and your scriptures have been revealed to such an extent that we can see your gospel so clearly. And Lord, we pray that uh, any here would not be living their life uh, trying again and trying again, but that everyone in this room and listening uh, through the live stream in the different spaces, Lord, we pray that we would all come to find true rest in Christ and, and that we would cease striving and just rest and enjoy him. So we thank you for this. We pray you'd bless your word in proportion to the accuracy in which it was taught. And we ask this in Christ's name.